I'm afraid I might need this today. Just want to put that there. Uh, just uh, one quick thing uh, about Dean, our intern who's coming in. Uh, we provide housing for our interns, so if any of you are willing, uh, have a, a spare bedroom that you're willing to, uh, to uh, put him up for the summer, we need that. Uh, someone who can take him in and, and house him. I will mention he is 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> so, if you just have a tiny little futon, probably not, unless he can lay diagonal on it or something. Uh, he's going to be, he's a big dude. So um, anyway, so uh, unless you live in one of those little tiny houses, then I don't know if those are still a thing. All right. But we're excited to have him in. And, and as uh, Ken said, we're talking uh, as well about a, a female intern and uh, just excited about this summer with the mission trip and, and camp and everything that's happening for our youth. Just a really exciting time for them. All right, well, we're going to continue in Ruth. As I said this morning, we're going to take a couple of weeks off with the things that happened over the next couple of Sundays, but we'll get back to Ruth uh, very shortly. I do, I want to encourage you once more to be reading this book. It's only four small chapters. It's all story, um, and it's interesting. But the, the more you read, I think the more you pick out details, right? The more things start to, start to, to, to sharpen for you. And I've had several of you mention that. that I, I never saw that part in, in Ruth. And so uh, that's the beauty of Scripture, right? We go back to it, we go back to it, and, and we go back. It's, it's never like, oh, yeah, I, I knew that. Like, no, there's always something new to tell us this morning, so to tell us when we go to it. So uh, if you look at the ingredients on the screen, though, um, I wonder if anyone knows what that would make just by looking at the ingredients. And I realize I don't have like a, a baking time or a temperature or anything like that. But does anybody know what that would make if you put that together and bake it? Yeah. It's a basic white cake, right? That's, that's the ingredients for just a, the most basic white cake. Your mom's recipe probably looks different, right? Your family secret family recipe probably has some more exotic ingredients in it if you want something different. But if you just want a basic white cake, that's all you need right there. But I wonder what would happen if we, if we left ingredients out. If you just left one of those ingredients out. What would happen? Now, I'm not much of a baker, so I had to look it up. <laughs> I didn't want to sure exactly what everything does there. Um, but there's so many cool shows out there and stuff. Uh, if you've ever booked, baked, you've probably left something out, haven't you, at one point? You probably left an ingredient out. And, and maybe it didn't make much of a difference, but then sometimes it completely ruins it, right? So you look at that list, and, and you know, if we, if, we left, um, if we left out just the, the uh, well, the smallest ingredient down there is, is the baking powder. But man, you leave that out of a cake? You're going to get a dense, hard, right? It's not going to be fluffy and light. It's not going to rise. So that's, not a, that's probably not the best one to take out. Um, if you leave out, uh, of course, the, the eggs, that, that not only gives it structure, but it moisture helps it rise as well. If you leave out the sugar, you're going to have a very bland cake. It's also not going to be as moist. I, I found that out. Sugar helps with moisture too somehow. I'm not quite sure how that works. But, you know, probably the one that, that you could do without and probably barely notice is maybe the vanilla extract. But I know some of you would say, no, that's sacrilegious, right? Can't leave out the vanilla. Um, but that's probably the one that if you had to leave something out, that'd be the one. But, of course, I had to, you know, no one will tell you what, what cake without flour is because you don't have cake if you don't use flour, right? I mean, that is the most important ingredient. It gives it all of its structure and makes it cake at the end of the day. So when you, when, you, when you follow a recipe, right, when you, we, we use the word follow, right? Have you ever thought of the, uh, obeying a recipe, right? Obeying a recipe? Some of us aren't that strict, right? We're like, eh, I'll just kind of eyeball it. I'll measure it out a little bit. Maybe I'll do this instead of that. But I'm, I'm one of those people that when I have a recipe, I, I want to obey the recipe. I want to make sure I get what I want out of it. And if these people say this is what it takes, then I'm like, all right, I'm going to make it like that. Because I want what I want out of this thing. And if you leave something out, you might not get what you want. If you don't follow it completely, obey it completely, then what are you going to get? Probably not what you wanted. Now, I'm sure at this point you're going, what in the world does this have to do with Ruth? And I get it, but stick with me for a little bit longer. We're going to get to Ruth, I promise. For the past two weeks, we've been viewing this story of Ruth through the lens of God's restoration, right? How God restores it, uh, this, this family and the things that go into accomplishing that restoration. Because we have this cool story of this family and how God works in their lives. To, and it's just so amazing. The last week, the main ingredient that we discussed, of course, to that restoration is God's hesed, his faithful, loving kindness. 
That is the flower of this recipe of restoration, right? It is the most important ingredient. It forms the basis for restoration. But when we add our loving, faithful loving kindness to God's, then we have an even more complete recipe, right? When we add our faithfulness to God's faithfulness that will not give us up, that will not quit. If you remember at the beginning of the series, we discussed how this story of Ruth occurs during the time of the judges, right? It happens during the time of the judges. During this time, it's an understatement to say that the people were struggling to obey, right? It's an understatement to say that they were struggling with faithfulness. God was their king, but they demonstrated little to no faithfulness in him. They continued to seek other gods. They kept repeating, remember that cycle of disobedience, punishment, restoration or rescue, punishment, uh, disobedience, punishment, restoration. They just kept going through that cycle. And the problem, though, that no matter how many times God punished them, no matter how many times they came back to him, they would fall away again, over and over again. That's why the most repeated, repeated phrase in Judges is this phrase, again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You see that phrase over and over in Judges, or something like, very much like it, all over the place. And what I want to do this morning is go back to Judges for just a little bit to kind of paint this picture a little bit more fully, because I think that Ruth is told in this sequence where it is for a reason. It's trying to tell us something about this this cycle that the, the Israelites were in. And what happens in this story of Ruth, what I want us to hopefully see this morning is what else goes into restoration. So if you're wanting God to restore you in your life, what else goes into that? As you know, at the beginning of Judges, God had brought the people out of Egypt, right? He had had led them to the edge of the promised land, and he told them, it's yours if you'll just go take it. But they rebelled. They would not. They could not do it. They did not have enough faith in God. And they said, we look like grasshoppers to the Canaanites. We can't do this. You see, the problem was they were judging the the potential of their success. They were judging it on the size of the enemy and not the size of their God. Right? And any time you do that, any time you look at the size of your enemy and not the size of your God, then that's a recipe, forgive my pun again, that's a recipe for disaster, right? That is a recipe for disaster. And so God decides, okay, you're not going to take the land, then I'm going to take you back out into the wilderness. And basically, God says, I'm going to kill off a generation, this unfaithful generation of Israelites. And I'm going to raise up a generation who will take the land. And so that's exactly what happens. At the end of this 40-year trek through the desert, God leads through Joshua, led the people back into the land to get rid of the Canaanites, right? To, To remove the Canaanites from the land. And that was God's command. God didn't say just, hey, move in next door to the Canaanites. He said, you need to remove the Canaanites from the land. He wanted them to completely eradicate or drive them out. And we we know that part of that reason is he wants to bless his people, right? And and, and if that land is still, still inhabited by people who are serving foreign gods, who are doing abominable things, then his people are going to be influenced. And so he said, no, you've got to wipe them out. You've got to clear it out so that you can have what I want for you. But that's, so he wanted to bless Israel. But it was also about judgment for, Canaanite, for the Canaanites. And I think sometimes we forget that, that that's part of it as well. And it sounds terrible to, to just wipe a people out or to, 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 to drive them out of the land that they had been possessing for so long. But God says it was because of their detestable evil practices. In, in uh, Leviticus 18, as God's giving the law to them, he says, and this is a warning to Israel first, but he says, look, the land itself has been punished. The land itself has been defiled. And so the land is going to, and this is kind of graphic, I know, but the land vomited them out. It said, I cannot take this anymore because they were doing such awful, terrible things. God promised the people in these verses, if you do the same as the Canaanites, this will happen to you too. Right? If you do the detestable things of the Canaanites, the land will also spit you out. Now, so we might think God's being so harsh to the Canaanites. No, he's bringing the same judgment on them that he would bring on Israel. And he would. Eventually the land would spit the Israelites out. It would take them into, God would take them into captivity. And so that did happen. But God treats people the same. He's not treating the Canaanites any worse. He's, he's judging them for their detestable acts. 
And we read, as, as the, the, the people started to come into the land of Canaan, right? Things went well at first. It actually went really well for a little bit, right? For a little bit. They started to conquer the land, and, and that conquest started well. Those first tribes started taking the land. Remember, God had told them, you're over here and you're over here, right? And so they started to come in, and things went well, and God gave them victory. God fought for them. That was the promise he made. If you do this, if you're faithful to me, I will drive the people out. And that started to happen. And then we get to verse 27 of Judges chapter 1. And there's a really big but, right? And I don't mean that silly. I'm just saying, this is a big, right? But Manasseh did not drive the people out of Beth Shan or Ta'anak or Dor and on and on. It's a big di- that's a big difference, isn't it? Everything's going well. And then all of a sudden, it's not going so well. And there's this first but, but then there's several subsequent neithers or nors in the last half of this chapter here. It says, nor did Ephraim, neither did Zebulun, nor did Asher, and so on and so on. And others started following the example, unfortunately, that Manasseh had set. And so in verses 28 through 36 of Judges chapter 1, seven different tribes are specifically named who did not obey God and drive the Canaanites out of the land. They either made them their slaves, or they just lived next door to them, or they just wouldn't do what needed to happen that God told them they needed to do. And so this led God to send an angel. He sent it to a place that would be called Bochum, which means weeping, because that was how the people were going to react to the message this angel brought. They were going to mourn, and they were going to wail. And so from now on, that place was called weeping. And here's the warning that we see in Judges. He says, I brought you up out of Egypt. I led you to the land I swore to give your ancestors. And I even said, I will never break my covenant with you. That is God's chesed we talked about last week, right? That is his faithful loving kindness. I'm not going to give you up. But you, here's what he expected of them, but you will not make a covenant with the people of this land. You will not be friends with these people. You will drive them out. You shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me disobeyed me. You didn't do what I said. Why have you done this? And I also said this. I said, I will not drive them out before you. And so they will become traps for you and their gods become snares to you. God said, if you were going, if you obeyed me, I was going to drive them out. I was going to work for you. This was not that it was going to be easy, but if you remember what God wanted to do is he wanted to give them water from wells. They didn't dig. He wanted to give them grapes from vineyards. They didn't plant. He wanted to put them in houses they didn't build, in cities they didn't, but that they didn't build, right? He wanted to give them that. But because they would not obey, God said, I can't do it for you. This is the angels quoting directly from what God told them through Joshua at the end of Joshua. His people, if you determine to obey me, I will drive out your enemies. But you haven't done that, and so they're going to be a trap for you. This is not going to go well, God says. You refuse to obey me, so I'm going to hold back. Have you ever noticed that disobedience often starts with delayed or incomplete obedience? I mean, what I mean by that is it's more common for us to just put off obeying or to only obey partially than it is for us to just flat out disobey, right? You very rarely see someone just, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, toddlers, yes, right? We very rarely do that, though, as, as adults, Oh, man, I will, I will put off obeying all, all day, right? I'll, I'll only obey partially. The problem with that, though, is that's not obedience. We used to have a saying in our house with our kids, and I know they'll remember this. We used to say, delayed obedience is, and we would expect them to say, disobedience. If you don't obey me when I tell you to, you're disobeying me. Because you're going to say, well, I'll, I'll do that later. I'll put that, you know, we'll wait until I get off. Well, you know. And it'll never happen, right? It'll never happen. Incomplete obedience is disobedience. And this is what's happening here. They heard the warning, right? They heard the warning, but they didn't obey completely. They weeped and they wailed and things were good for a little bit. Because they didn't continue to say, okay, God, you're right. We need to drive these people out. They didn't do that. Things went south very quickly because disobedience grows, right? We think we can control it, don't we? Let's be honest. We think, hey, I I could do a little bit of bad stuff over here, right? 
You hear people say, I, I know I've got my vices, right? But that's, that's okay. I'm, I've controlled them, right? I'm, I've got them contained. That's not how disobedience works, though. Disobedience does not work that way. And so we read, as we read a couple of weeks ago, when Joshua's, Joshua's generation died out, this, this new generation came up that did not know what God had done for his people. And that, as I've said, is a recipe for disaster, is a recipe for evil. And that's exactly what happened. If you read in the verses after that, in verse 11 of chapter 2, it says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Huh. Who would have thought that would happen, right? A whole generation rises up who doesn't know God. And of course, what do they do? They do evil. And they served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them up out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. God says, if you don't obey me completely, there are going to be snares and there are going to be traps, and that's exactly what happens. You see, when we decide to obey incompletely, or only partially, or put it off, disobedience grows. What we do is we try to mix our desire to please God with our desire for the world, right? And we try to think, oh, I can balance those two, right? I can keep that in check. I, I can handle that. The problem is you cannot make sla- sin your slave. Sin will make you its slave. You cannot make sin your slave. It doesn't work like that. And so when we tolerate even a little bit of it in our lives, it's going to grow. And this is what, exactly what happened with Israel. They sought life apart from God, and they started serving these other gods of the Canaanites who promised these fleshly, right, earthly desires because the gods of the, of the Canaanites, they were the gods of lust and of sex and of selfishness and of violence and of hatred and greed. They were gods of the earth. And disobedience only grows if we give it space and time. Right? You, you see, we see this with children. You show me a selfish, defiant six-year-old who no one is working with and no one is trying to teach, and I promise you in a few years you're going to have a defiant, rebellious teenager. And if no one steps in and helps that teenager understand what, what they need, they're left to their own devices, pretty soon you're going to have an adult who does not obey who is as selfish as anything, and who leaves a swath of destruction everywhere they go. Because disobedience only grows. It only gets worse. Now, if disobedience, what happens here is the effect of unchecked disobedience had for the Israelites is very clear. It says that they arouse the Lord's anger. Why? Because they forsook him. They turned their back on him. Because they were unfaithful to him. And they served the Baal and the Ashtoreths. So because his anger was aroused, the verse is going to say, God gave them to the hands of the raiders. He let them be sold into the, the enemies, in the hands of their enemies. And here's what happened. Every time they went out to fight a battle, that God who said, I'll fight for you, not only didn't fight for them, he fought against them. And they found themselves now fighting their own God. Because he said, I, can't, I cannot protect you. I cannot be here with you. I cannot bless you when you are disobedient, when you have turned your back on me. Disobedience took them out of relationship with God. And because they were no longer in relationship with God, they felt the pain of what that means. Now, if disobedience makes us unfaithful and takes us out of right relationship with God, then the only hope of restoration on our part is to turn back is to return. The Israelites would do that during the time of the judges, right? They would, they would continue to come back to God, but they never did it completely. They would come back a little, just enough for God to raise up a judge, and, and things would go well for a while, but because they would not, still would not get rid of the Canaanites, because they still would not tear down the Ashtoreth poles, right? Burn the Baal altars, because they wouldn't do that. He never could. They never came back completely. But what we do find in the, in the book of Ruth, and now we're getting to Ruth, all right? In the book of Ruth, we do find a story of returning, don't we? Naomi had spent years among the Moabites, at least a decade or more. And in that time with the, that godless people, her life had in pretty much every way fallen apart, hadn't it? She had become bitter and hopeless. She had been emptied out in that place. And she finally decides when she hears that God is acting again to bless his people back home, she says, all right, it's time to return. And that's what she did. She went back to her people. The text does not say that Naomi suffered because of sin. I've said that already, and I'm going to keep saying that. But we have a very clear story here 
of a literal return to the promised land of God. A woman who says, I'm going to go back. How many important stories of returning are there in Scripture? That's, I thought about that for a little bit. That's a, that's a theme, isn't it? I think of Moses, who was once the prince of Egypt, right, in the household of Pharaoh, and now he has, goes out into the wilderness and he returns to Egypt. But this time, he's not in the household of Pharaoh. He's now the prophet of God. And he has to speak against the, the house of Pharaoh. That's a return. What about the rem, remnant, faithful remnant of Israelites, right, who God brings back after captivity in Babylon? He brings them back, these faithful few, and they come back and they begin to rebuild. So we get the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah and so many others who get to rebuild Israel, who get to rebuild the walls and the temple, who get to restore God's place. What about the story Jesus tells us of the prodigal son? The story of a rebellious son, a greedy son, who turns his back on his father and says, you know what, at least if I go back, I could be a slave in his household. A servant would be better than what I am now. And instead of becoming a servant, he finds himself wrapped in the arms of his loving father. He says, my son has returned. Returning is a super important theme of scripture. And it's important to us. Returning as Naomi did is so important. We might look at the pattern of judges, right? Of them falling away, getting punished. And we might see how many times they failed. It's just, it's miserable. They just kept failing over and over again. But what we also see is a returning over and over again. And the most important piece of that is a God who takes them back. Is a God whose faithfulness never, ever wavers. They come back and he says, welcome back. You're my children. I love you. I've made covenant with you. I will never let you go. No matter how far you go from me, I will take them back. His faithfulness never wavers. So maybe the life of a faithful person at the end of the day is not defined by all those mistakes and sins we made along the way, but by the constant and consistent turning back to God when we do. Maybe that's what we need to make sure we do. Returning to God. That's the first step. But it's not the only step. What we need to complete our return to God, and I think this is what Ruth is teaching us, is humble obedience to him as well. If we're going to complete that, because we could just keep coming back and coming back. But the missing ingredient for the Israelites was this humble obedience. They would never fully obey what he wanted for them. God would allow them to be punished, to feel the pain of their disobedience, but it never caused them to complete their obedience to him. And so they kept those altars of Baal, like I said. They kept those Ashtoreth poles. And they said, we can have it all. We can do both. They tolerated and even joined in the abhorrent religious practices of the Canaanites. But in the book we see something, in the book of Ruth, we see something very different. We find humble, obedient people. I, and I can't, I can't stress this enough. We find Ruth and Boaz, these two just amazing people. We talked about last week about Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi, right? How, how she was this humble woman who said, I want to go where you go, but I'm willing to work hard. She gets back to Bethlehem and she works hard to obey her mother-in-law. She even obeyed, we're going to see this in a couple of weeks, she even obeyed when Naomi had, let's, let's say, some, some uh, less than reputable maybe plans for her, but she still obeyed. Well, we're going to get to chapter 3, I promise. She, right? If you've been reading, you know what I'm talking about. All right, If you haven't, all right? But, but she obeyed. She was, she was faithful to that. Ruth said those powerful words, right? Those powerful words, your people will be my people, your God, my God. But she backed it up with obedience and humility. She was an amazing woman. God loves to hear our voices when we praise him, when we speak to him, when we pray to him, when we sing, when we read our, the word of God, right? He loves to hear our voices, But if our actions are then incongruent with our words, then we will never please God. Remember what our Savior, our Lord, said when he quoted Isaiah by saying, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You can say it all day long, but if it's not here, if our relationship with God is not strong, if we're not obedient to him, then it doesn't matter. Obedience is the language with which we speak our love to God. Okay? Obedience is the language with which we speak our love to God. It's the proof of our faithfulness to Him. Grace saves us. 
and grace alone. But humble obedience is our response to the grace we've been given. And Boaz, man, Boaz knew this. He is not it's, not, it's not really thrown in our face in this story, right? It's not really put necessarily front and center. But if you know your scripture, then you're going to see it. If you know God's law, then you can see what a humble, obedient man Boaz was. Remember, Ruth just happened to find herself, as we talked about last week. Kevin even talked about coincidences this morning, right? That happy little coincidence that was really God leading her to the right field. She ends up in the field of Boaz. And that's amazing because he was a relative of Elimelech, right? And that's important because he can redeem Ruth and Naomi and their land and bring, restore them in, in, in the law's eyes there in, in the people of Israel. But that's, that's, that's later in the story. <laughs> What's important in this moment is that Boaz was willing to provide for Ruth. What she found herself in was the field of a godly man. And that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Right? In Leviticus 19, which, uh, by the way, I think that's a chapter every Christian should know almost by heart. If you don't know Leviticus 19, you haven't read it in a while or at all, please read it. I think it sheds light on so many things that Jesus teaches us. But there are specifically two different commands in there that are pertinent toward this story. In verses 9 and 10 of Leviticus uh, 19, it says this, and this, this is a, a command from God. When you reap the harvest of your land... Do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. The gleanings were the things that fell to the ground, right? Don't gather those up. Don't go back over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen on the ground, right? Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. God specifically asked his people to not be efficient when they harvested, right? To not be thorough at all. To just, just... You know, gather once, but then that's it, and leave the rest. Don't don't go around the edges. Don't go back over a second time. Why? So that I can provide, so that you can provide for those in your midst who don't have their own land. The poor and the foreigner. God's concern was for them. And so he made this law to say, provide for those around you. When you are blessed, I'll give you enough, but I want you to be able to... And and notice that they had to work, right? This This wasn't a handout. They had to go work. They had to go glean their own, their, their, harvest their own food. But it gave them this opportunity to do that. But notice God's concern is specifically with the foreigner. That's important. Why? Because that's what Ruth is. Later in Leviticus 19, we read this. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. We see, we see Boaz do that, don't we? We see him welcome Ruth, even though his, his, his overseer said, well, you know she's a Moab from Moabite, right? And Boaz doesn't care. And that maybe he doesn't care because he understands what God wants from him. Now notice why this is important to God. He says, love them as yourselves. Why? Because you were foreigners in Egypt. Don't forget that you were once foreigners in a foreign land. And I brought you into this land. So when foreigners come into your midst, you treat them well. You take care of them. Boaz not only recognized Ruth's faithfulness and her hard work, but see, here's the thing. Boaz was already obeying God. He was already in that mindset, acting out God's concern for the foreigners, for the widows, for the poor. He was that kind of man. He knew God had blessed him, and now he humbly obeyed God in blessing others. And so this story moves along on that obedience, that faithful, humble obedience. It's part of God's plan for restoration. He loves us enough to accept us where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. What he wants is to lead us into an obedient life because that is how he will bless us and how he will rain down his grace and his love. Now, humble obedience, of course, was one of the main ingredients to God's salvation of the world. Jesus Christ humbled himself enough to put on flesh to be a servant, and to make himself obedient to death, even death on a cross. Humble obedience is what kept him on that cross. It's what led him to that cross and what led him to die for our sins. He wanted to obey God's plan, but he wanted to do it because of his deep and abiding love for us. And so the whole basis of our salvation as Christians is humble obedience of Christ. Christ. 
what he did for us. And so this morning, if you want to obey the gospel this morning, this gospel that has brought you salvation and restoration, as we talked about in the class, it's already happened, right? The hope is already secure. All you have to do is accept it. Be baptized into Christ and to his death and resurrection so that you can walk a new life, so that you can be in right relationship with God and he can begin to bless you. Obedience is a process. It's not something that just happens automatically, right? We get it all right all the time. But remember, what, what we have to do as Christians is keep returning back. Keep coming back. So if you need to come back this morning, then we have that that's available to you as well. Whatever you need this morning, if you need prayers from, from, from this family, we want to be here with you as we stand and as we sing.